So, we're going to take a break from chemistry for a second and talk about dorms, but I promise it relates back, so if you can bear with me through this, this whole unit will be a lot easier for you. This is a large analogy for what we're going to be doing, but a lot of students seem to understand it better when we talk about it in terms you understand. So today we're talking about dorm rooms. Imagine you had to live in a seven-story dorm that had no elevator and just stairs. Which floor would you want to live on and why? Most of you are probably thinking you'd want to live fairly close to the bottom because you don't want to be climbing seven sets of stairs every day to get to your dorm room. And that's the logic of the university you go to. So the do dorm building you live in has four types of rooms. The first is the S rooms, and those are the super rooms. They are the best rooms. They are the biggest. Everyone wants an S room. Then there's the P rooms, which are the pretty good rooms. They're not as big as the S rooms, but they're still pretty nice. There's enough room for all of your stuff. D rooms are the dumpy rooms. They're kind of small and not the best. Last is F, the fantastically bad rooms, and most people have closets bigger than these rooms. So it's a tight squeeze for you and your roommate. So most people want the super rooms, which is the logic of your university. However, because of the fire marshal, there's some rules that have to be in place. You have been placed in charge of assigning students to dorm rooms. You must follow these guidelines when you assign them, and these are drafted by the school and the fire marshal. You can only have a maximum number of two students in any one room. Everyone gets a roommate. Students must live as close to the first floor as possible. The fire marshal told us that even though the S rooms are the best, you can't have people all the way up on the seventh floor in an S room if you don't have the rooms below them filled. When filling one type of room, all rooms must be full before going on to a different type of room. So everyone in an S room, for example, has to have a roommate before you can start filling the P rooms on that same floor. When filling one type of room on a floor, you must place one student in each before pairing them. So in a P room, you're going to put one student in each P room and then go back and give them a roommate. We'd rather have all of the P rooms with one person living in them instead of people having roommates while certain rooms go empty. However, the university kind of negotiated with the fire marshal knowing that the S and P rooms are kind of the favorite. So the exception to our rule is you must fill the fourth floor S rooms before, before you fill the third floor D rooms. Then you can go back and fill the fourth floor P rooms. You must fill the fifth floor S rooms before you go and fill the fourth floor D rooms. Then you can go back and fill the fifth floor P rooms. So they're kind of letting us fill at least the S rooms on the next floor before the D rooms. It's kind of a nice trade-off for you. However, it's going to make assigning rooms a little bit confusing for you, but I think you'll get the hang of it. So this is what your dorm building looks like. We only have one S room on the first floor. We have an S room on the second floor and then three P rooms. On the third floor, we have the S room, three P rooms, and then five D rooms. But remember, according to the exception, on this third floor, you're going to fill your S and P rooms and then go up and fill your fourth floor S room up here. So we're going to get to fill that. Then you're going to go back and fill the D rooms down here. And then you can go up and fill those P rooms next. And you can do that on every floor. All right. First semester, you have 10 students to place in your dorm room. They thought they'd give you a break. So we're going to put tallies in our dorm building as to where everyone goes. So we go back to our picture and we're going to put in 10 people. So looking at your tallies, you put one person here, give them a roommate because we don't go onto that second floor until everyone has a roommate. So we go up. In the S, we give everyone in a roommate in one type of room before going to the next. So in this S room, this person gets a roommate. Now we can move on to our P rooms. We still have six people left to place. So we go five, six, seven, three left. So instead of going to the next floor, we give them roommates. Eight, nine, ten. 
So we have two people living in a first floor S room, two people living in a second floor S room, and six people living in third floor P rooms. Okay, so second semester, they give you a little bit more responsibility. Six students want to transfer into your dorm because you have the best dorm ever. So you're going to have to place them accordingly. To place our 16 people, we're going to do just like we did before. Two people in that first floor S room. Two people in the second floor S room. Six people in our second floor P rooms. So, so far, we're up to 10 people. You already did this one. Still have six more, so we're going to go on to the third floor. Two in the S room. We're up to 12. So, 13, 14, 15. But we don't go on to a D room. We're going to give those P people roommates first. 16. Not so bad. If you had trouble with this, bring your questions tomorrow. Because you did such an awesome job, the university wanted to give you a chance to do this in an easier way. Instead of just drawing tallies in your dorm building, they wanted to give you the chance to develop a shorter way. And the best way to do this is you're going to use big numbers for the floor number, letters for the type of room, and then a superscript, which is a small number up top, to tell us the number of students in any one type of room. So a great example is for nine students, you would have 1S2, 2S2, 2P5. So let's do some tallies and look at that. So if we were drawing in for our nine people, we would have put two people in this room, two people in this room, and then gone six, seven, eight, and person nine would have ended up in there for a total of four people in the P rooms. So, just like on our tallies, this is the shorthand way. You saw that you put two people in first floor S, two people in second floor S, and then five people in the second floor P. So, You get to assign more students now. First semester, you're going to assign 18 students to dorm rooms. Second semester, you're going to assign 20 students to dorm rooms. I'm going to go back and let you look at that picture, and you're going to assign your 18 and 20 students, but this time write it out in your shorthand notation. Pause this video and undo and play again once you have your shorthand notation written out. All right. So for first semester, for 18 students, you should have had two students in the first floor S room, two students in the second floor S room, six students in the P room, two students in the third floor S room, and six students in the third floor P room. For 20 students, you are going to have to go up one floor. So we have same all the way up to the 3P6, at which point, this is where some of you may have gotten tricked. Don't forget the exception to our rule. We don't have to fill that third floor D room until our fourth floor S room is filled. So we went up to the fourth floor S to put those final two students in there. If you put them in D rooms, don't worry. Just remember it for next time. All right. You did such an awesome job last year, the university put you in charge of a second dorm building. So you have a lot more students to place this year. First semester, you have 23 students in dorm one and 27 students in dorm two. Second semester, you have 30 students in dorm one and 35 students in dorm two. Pause this video, take a second, and write the shorthand notation out on your own. You can look at this building while you do it, but make sure that you have those numbers written down before you unpause this video. All right, so for first semester, these are your two shorthand notations you should have ended up with. 
Once again, you are probably good all the way up through the 3P6. No exceptions to our rules, but then that exception comes into play. So you went and put the two students in the 4S2 room, and but we can't go into those 4P rooms until we've put students in the 3D rooms. I know as an RA you hate doing that, but you had to. So you put the three students in those third floor D rooms. They didn't even take up all the rooms, so you couldn't go on to the fourth floor P rooms. 27 students, the same thing happens. You filled up the third floor. You went on to the, you thir filled up the third floor S and P rooms. Then you got to go to the fourth floor S rooms before you had to do the third floor D rooms. And you only filled in seven students there, so you didn't have to go on to the fourth floor P rooms. Second semester, things went a little bit differently. So with 30 students, you actually filled up all of your third floor D rooms, but you still didn't have to go on to a fourth floor S room. For 35 students, though, when you filled up your fourth floor, your third floor D rooms, you got to go back to the fourth floor and start filling in those P rooms with your remaining six students. I know these shorthand notations are still kind of long, but imagine if you had to draw all these tallies. If you weren't getting these notations, write down any questions you have and bring them to class tomorrow. The reason it's important you understand this, because I know what you're thinking. These are all about dorm rooms, Ms. Hinkson. None of this really matters. The reason this all matters is the connection to chemistry. So how does placing students in a dorm room relate to chemistry? It's all about what we're going to be talking about, this whole unit, which is electrons. So in this case, the students that you are placing in dorm rooms are electrons. Floors are the energy levels that electrons live on, essentially. Room types are the shapes of orbitals. Electrons go in different shapes depending on what level they're at, just like your rooms were different sizes depending on what type of room they were. And last, our rules for filling the rooms are the energy requirements. So you actually know all of the rules, except you just have to go back and substitute students, floors, and room types with our new vocabulary. If you understood this, this whole unit is going to be a lot easier for you. If you struggled with this, I'd recommend watching the video again and coming back with questions to class tomorrow.